and thank you for everyone still joining. Uh, it's been a great range of different talks tonight, focusing on a range of different sports, um, definitely highlighting some high quality work around training, monitoring, testing interventions going on over at this part of the world, certainly. So yeah, as Marco alluded to, just to finish, probably something slightly different compared to what we've had so far. Um, so this talk will predominantly focus on kind of an intervention IPC, and hopefully it will just open the doors to how it can be used in different contexts um, for different levels of, of participating athletes. So just as a, a starting point, um, as IPC can be defined as basically repeated intermittent bouts of occlusion, so arterial blood flow restriction. Uh, full recovery between bouts, usually five minutes each. And the idea of the intermittent clamping and the intermittent ischemia is to induce protection against a sustained ischemic bout. However, over recent years, IPC has actually been used as a performance enhancer or a potential performance enhancer. So most of the literature to date when looking at sports performance has actually looked at the effects of IPC acutely when it's been applied before, in and around a warm-up, with the sole aim of acutely enhancing performance. However, as my talk in the title suggests, I'm actually going to discuss it as a training method because this is kind of the point of this forum tonight. So training can be defined as the use of a repetitive stimulus that develops targeted physiological attributes. And to date, I think the literature when using repeated bouts of IPC over a duration of time has really focused on three key areas. Firstly, you've got some literature looking at maybe four to eight weeks of using IPC before an actual training session, say high intensity training. Secondly, you've got maybe eight weeks of repeated IPC, just IPC and no exercise. And thirdly, you've got literature that has assessed five to seven days of using IPC on a daily basis, again with no exercise, and the, the outcomes that this can potentially have on a physical basis. But first, before we actually get into these studies, I think it's important to highlight some of the, uh, some of the contextual similarities between both ischemic preconditioning and high intensity exercise training. So this paper, a great paper done uh, by Dick Tyson's group in Holland, they basically showed some evidence that both ischemic preconditioning and interval training induce similar physiological responses and both can actually cause remote conditioning. And it was suggested that the similar patterns of muscle deoxygenation responses to both IPC and HIT is a key primary mechanism behind why both actually do exert remote conditioning responses um, to tissue infarct and damage. Some other crossover potential mechanisms that are resultant from both high intensity interval training and IPC are reserved to be greater upregulation of the nitric oxide pathway, which has implications for vascular function, and more rapid depletion of ATP, which actually has implications for the muscle itself um, with certain kind of functions such as better maintenance and cell resting potential and prevention of cellular death during injury or insult. So I think the first question to ask is, can we actually enhance the adaptive response to an exercise training session when ischemic preconditioning is applied before it? And as I said, I'll discuss two specific papers that have looked at this to date um, using a four to eight week period where they've assessed IPC either two or three times weekly before high intensity interval training. So the first study assessed the impact of IPC over eight weeks on running performance. And in highly trained middle distance runners with a VO2 max of around 64, 65 mils per kilo per minute, the main finding was the study um, showed that IPC treatment before three high intensity sessions per week did not improve maximal oxygen consumption nor one kilometer time trial performance more effectively than just doing HIIT training alone. A later study published 2020 actually showed some conflicting evidence. And they, they actually showed that in endurance athletes, slightly lesser trained this time with a VO2 max of around 57, 58 mils per kilo per minute. Uh, when IPC and sprint interval training in the form of wing gates were performed over eight sessions over a period of four weeks, the IPC plus sprint interval training condition led to greater improvements in mean power output around 5% and completion time of the time trial around 2% improvement in performance 
um, as well as increase fatigue resistance during a Wingate test versus just doing Wingate training alone. Just as the other study suggested, there was no change in maximal oxygen consumption or there was no change in Wingate test power uh, between groups. What was interesting, however, they used some NIRS data collection and they did suggest the current study presents some evidence to suggest that there was increased muscle perfusion and peripheral oxygen extraction in the IPC plus sprint interval training condition. So the, the literature in this area is, is pretty limited to date, but you know I think we need to start asking some questions immediately. So this may follow some literature trends where the better or well-trained group did not receive a benefit from ischemic preconditioning plus HIIT training. The actual exercise intensity of the HIIT training session may, may actually influence um, how IPC has an effect. So the, the study in the runners over eight weeks used a very aerobic dominant HIIT session where it was only 10 minutes of tempo work and three minutes of kind of 1K race pace. Uh, whereas the study that did show benefits of IPC plus training used a sprint interval training method. So very, very intense exercise. So this could be a factor. Also, importantly, the performance task. The study that showed no difference used a very anaerobic predominant under three minutes of total work task. Whereas the study that found a benefit of IPC plus training, uh, the total work duration for that performance task was eight to nine minutes, which sits within that kind of VO2 max aerobic domain. Whilst there was no improvements in VO2 max, this paper did suggest there was evidence that there was increased muscle perfusion and peripheral oxygen extraction in the IPC plus training group. So definitely something to consider there and some further work needs doing. But what happens when ischemic preconditioning is performed without exercise, say over eight weeks, three times a week, what can we expect on the body? So this study, great study performed, showed that compared to a control condition, so if you do nothing and you just do IPC three times weekly for a period of eight weeks, you'll see greater improvements in arterial function measured through flow mediated dilation, following ischemic preconditioning. However, repeated ischemic preconditioning when there's not training involved did not change microcirculatory function or fitness, maybe not too surprising. But when we think of the injured athlete who may not actually have a capacity to exercise or train, could this be something worth investigating? And we know that there are a range of physiological contributors to, to performance, including the cardiovascular system, skeletal muscle system, and even the central nervous system. And previous work has demonstrated that repeated increases in vascular shear stress represent an important stimulus for vascular adaptations in both function and structure. And this is because vascular adaptations are mediated by shear stress dependent mechanisms. Now this was a study done in 2010 and all they looked at was if you do exercise with a shear stress response on the vasculature versus a non-shear stress response exercise task as a control, what are the effects on the vasculature? And they showed, you can see this clearly, that over a period of eight weeks you start to get real significant improvements in flow mediated dilation, which is a function measure, uh, from week two to week six. However, looking at this data, it appears that by week eight, flow mediated dilation returns to the baseline, which may not make much sense. But when we actually take a look at the brachial dilatory response to ischemic exercise, which is a measure of structure and uh, structural remodeling, we can see that there's a significant difference over time. So both together, this study therefore highlights the time dependent changes in both arterial function and remodeling, uh, are both shear stress dependent, which is really, really good work. So again, to re-emphasize, for the injured athlete who may not have the capacity to train, given the fact that there is evidence that both IPC and HIIT training induce similar mechanisms and that IPC could potentially be used as an exercise mimetech, um, could we potentially use this for the injured athlete to give some physiological benefit? And based on the work so far, it certainly appears that for the vascular system, this may be a good, easy win. Finally, what happens when we apply five to seven days of IPC every single day with no training stimulus? And before we go into it, we need to ask ourselves what population or athlete might be interested in doing this. And we know that the tapering athlete has a significant reduction in training load. This is a time for recovery and adaptation with a pure focus on resting for race day. So could this be something of interest? And this study, I'm going to start with the most interesting study that I've found to date. 
in untrained population, so 38 mils per kilo per minute VO2 max, they assess the effects of seven days of IPC on both aerobic and anaerobic performance. What they showed was quite remarkable. 9.5% increases in VO2 max after just 48 hours of ischemic preconditioning treatment, followed by a 12.8% increase in VO2 max after seven days. Maximal aerobic power also correlated 18.5% after 48 hours of IPC and 16.1% improvement after seven days, not to mention the 8.7% increase in Wingate performance. You can see the red highlighted circles on the right. It was an independent groups design and it actually appears that the IPC baseline for whatever does seem a little bit lower than the sham condition. So this may have artificially inflated the relative change between the groups, may have been missed. However, let's say that this is still the case. The changes in aerobic performance are truly remarkable in this population and a little bit tongue in cheek, but if this is correct, it's likely that IPC is probably the best thing since sliced bread. So, you know, it, it does need some future research and maybe a, a kind of repeat model study to see whether the effects can be maintained. But this is certainly something to look at. Secondly, really interesting study at altitude. What happens when we apply IPC for five days when we do a 12 kilometer time trial at very high altitude, over 4,000 meters at peak? Well, in moderately trained adults, 42 years of age on average, five days of IPC significantly improved 12 kilometer time trial running, whilst better maintaining oxygen saturation and attenuating the normal hypoxic increases of pulmonary arterial pressures, which are key contributors to why we cannot perform as well at altitude compared to sea level. And from a previous slide, one of the mechanistic insights collected from NIRS data in the performance task where IPC plus HIIT training uh, resulted in a beneficial uh, outcome, the authors uh, highlight that some evidence again suggested that there was increased muscle perfusion and peripheral oxygen extraction, and this may be a key contributing mechanism to why IPC may be a good target in a repeated manner if you're going to altitude. Finally, seven days of ischemic preconditioning on cycling efficiency um, they used healthy individuals, 45 mils per kilo per minute. After seven days, there was no change in VO2 max. However, there was increases in aerobic test performance with a 9% increase in ramp, ramp test performance, correlating to around 5% increase in maximal aerobic power or what max. Whilst there was no change in gross efficiency, you can see from the figure on the bottom left, there was a 3.1% significant improvement in delta cyclone efficiency. This led the authors to conclude that these changes occur in a short time frame, just seven days, and thus could potentially be utilized by athletes during preparation for competition. Whilst the magnitude of improvement may appear small, it could markedly influence performance in prolonged cycling. These authors also go on to state in the discussion that repeated bouts of IPC can actually impact the muscle. So not only can we impact the vasculature, in a repeated IPC model, we can also impact skeletal muscle function. So as you can see, hopefully I've built a picture where we're starting to really build some bases of at least maintaining basic physiological function across a range of different athletes in different contexts. It is worth noting that all of this daily IPC work to date has been used in less or recreationally trained individuals. So more work is needed on more athletic populations to really test whether this is a useful intervention over just the normal taper protocols that an athlete might undertake. So a summary slide, when IPC is used before training, there are a range of uh, moderating factors. These could be actual training status, the hit stimulus involved, is it an aerobic or an anaerobic predominant hit stimulus? And obviously, what is the performance task? Is it an anaerobically predominant performance task or is it really aerobically taxing? These are all factors that probably need further investigation. For the injured athlete, we've presented evidence stating that IPC is a valid exercise mimetech and certain mechanisms cross over really well with HIIT training. And we know certainly from a vascular function and structure perspective, just doing nothing but repeated bouts of IPC up to eight weeks, we know we can elicit um, significant changes. So this for the injured athlete may, may be an easy win. Finally, potentially for the tapering athlete when IPC is used on a daily basis, uh, we know that IPC can also impact the muscle as well as the vasculature. Uh, however, more work is needed in better trained populations. So I'd like to thank you. Um, thank you for your time. And I really hope that you've enjoyed 
this uh, this collection of talks, and I'll pass back over to Professor Marco. Thank you very much.